here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of Simon Rivers. This is the second part because um, we did part one earlier. Um, yes, he who was in um, Last Party, also the Old Field Youth Club and also Bitter Springs and has got a phenomenal amount of work. Um, so, yes, we're going to follow on from part one. If you heard part one, well done. If you haven't, don't worry about it. So, um, yeah, after several minutes of casual chat, we got down to... Yeah, I was talking about the production of the um, the records and uh, saying to Simon um, what a good sound they managed to get. A bit like the chameleons in the sense of being quite a big sonic soundscape. And this was Simon's response. I know, it's not that clear, but um, you'll pick it up as we get into the interview. Anyway, Simon, tell us about your uh, production and sound of the band. No, not all the time. I normally, normally we'd be thinking, oh, it doesn't sound as good as we wanted it. Well, most of the time you'd think that. Yes. So we'd, um, so we, like I said last time we were speaking, you'd, um, next time you went in, you try and do everything better. Which, uh, I don't know. You just kind of used what, uh, what you could at the time, where you were working, what studio you were working with, your equipment. I mean, yeah. All these I mean, things added. Because the one, th- the amazing thing is your your output, and and especially you know you had your phase one with the last party, but with bitter with as the Britta Springs, you you know it was absolutely phenomenal amount of output you were putting together. So was were you able to sort of were you just on a kind of creative flow at this stage? Um, well, I've mentioned before. I mean, we're always a step behind of of what we're actually doing. You know, we have to shelve stuff quite often because because not being able to afford to go and record uh, when you need to and stuff you know it's expensive it always has been expensive recording and when you're self-funded which we have been most of the time along the way we've been helped uh, now and again by small labels and things but generally it would be funded by ourselves yes. but yeah like, we're, we're usually a step behind ourselves I mean I've just I've j- it, what with the lockdown, I've, with, with the new group, Oldfield Youth Club, we've got an album to record. And since we started doing Oldfield Youth Club, we've probably, we could do two albums now. Like the <laughs> early stuff we were doing, which we've only recorded five or six songs of. Yes. Um, uh, we, had the, we had a whole album planned out at the start. Since then, we've got, you know, another 14, 15 songs. Um so there's always too much to record. The problem is what choosing what to record. You see this what is, I mean? This um, is interesting because I was talking to a guy who was in the in Micro Disney and the High Llamas, and he was saying that lyric writing takes him a long time. It sort of is it's a very slow process. But with you, it sounds like you're able to find your creative moves very quickly. Well, like I so it's just there's a backlog. You know, I've got folders upstairs with thousands of songs that go back you know for 40 years some of them and like i said not being a a professional band so to speak we've we've never had the um the luxury of just going to record everything all the time yeah and then you know picking what 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 you'd like out of that so Was we it... have to think long long and hard about what we do want to record because the chances although it seems like we've recorded a lot We've, we're always working as well at the same time. So Basically, we have to be a bit selective. Basically, it's like an iceberg, isn't it? You've got, this, you've got what you can see is just a little, a tenth of what's underneath. Yeah, yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah. But in some ways, that's that's probably good that we haven't got to record everything because then, you know, like we, uh, we'd be bugging out more and some of it might not be as good, but we just follow your instincts at the time when you're going in to record something and yeah. what gets recorded and what doesn't is usually stuff on the spur of the moment or or not you know it's uh, when you uh, normally, it, i was going to say when you normally go into the studio is it the case that you've got the songs completed and you're just kind of working you know just kind of putting them together or what do you occasionally create when you're in the studio oh hardly ever that way because like i said self-funded 
we're every second in a studio, we can be a bit annoying. Well, I can, you know, I'm rushing things along all the time. Sometimes yes. it, it would have been better if we did take more time over, you know, guitar sounds or whatever. But always one eye on the clock and the, the wallet, you know, that's that's always a factor in what we do. Yeah. But I've just booked the studio, luckily for me, for the first time ever. I put one cat with John Clayton, who I've worked with before. He's just done an LP with Jim Bob from Carter the Unstoppable Sex Machine. Do you remember? Oh, God, yes. I've, uh, got, I've got one of his books uh, on, on the shelf right behind me. Just <laughs> Yeah, well, Jim Bob works with, with John as well. And me, I've, since I went there with Vic Goddard to do some singing with Vic, we sort of we work with each other whenever we can. But I've booked his studio for a month. And uh, so I'm going to be doing the OYC LP and a solo album, which I'm at the same time. So hopefully I'll be able to get a lot of the songs out. Oh, God, you, in, can't, you can't sort of have a bit of a bad month, can you? You're going to have... You're in one go. Good. Well, like I said, I said to Kim, uh, we've only ever recorded when we've been working at the same time, you know, so... We haven't had the continuity except for Love Handles, the one time we made Love Handles, where that was in a residential studio. Yes. So, so hopefully there'll be some more of a unified sound on the on these two things I'm going to be doing. So. And when you, I mean, because you mentioned Vic, who's just got a, an album out himself, hasn't he? Which was, I think, produced by was it Mick Jones from The Clash and Big Audio Diamond? Yeah, we're wait, we're waiting for that. That's not coming out yet. Oh, is it's, it? It's. Yeah, I, I played piano on a lot of it, which was great. Um, so I'm not a piano player, but I, I, I learned a lot recently in piano. And I, Vic got me in to play piano with his group. He usually gets people in because they're cheap and that, because, you know, <laughs> me, <laughs> me and him get on well and he does stuff for me. And, you know, so I said, yeah, I'll do it. And it was the Joe Boxer's rhythm section and Johnny Britton on guitar. Oh my God, um, Johnny and it was great fun, yeah. We'd done done quite a few gigs together, and then so I got to record with Mick Jones. So I wasn't going to turn that down. So, no, no, that's and, amazing. And he was good fun, yeah, and yeah. It's, it, that's going to sound great, that LP. Oh, fantastic! But it's, it's interesting because I just I was going to say I just mm. done two interviews with members of the Joe Boxers, the singer and and one of the. I don't know if he was the bass player or the guitarist who went on to have a life in music. Chris, was it Chris? Well, he went into sort of, I suppose, event management and putting on raves and gigs and stuff. Oh, like that'd that would be Sean McCluskey. Right. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, he's the drummer. Sort of, he, right, and he an amazing story. The Joe Boxers really sort of having the big hit and then just not having anything to come back with after that, really. But they had a great. Yeah. Meeting, didn't they? So there you go. So do you are you finding that all the is everybody now in London land? Are you all kind of circling, looking for sort of like playing on each other's gig? Uh, vet, records at the moment because it sounds a bit like um uh, nice... no it's vic vic was a postman <laughs> and i was a postman and that that we was totally separate we didn't know each other vic worked at a different office i saw him in a in a post office magazine under his real name vic napper and i i said said to kim that, that bloke looks like vic goddard the singer so i run up twickenham post office and i he came on the phone and he's like, yeah, what do you want? Who the hell are you? Type of thing. And I said, oh, I'm making, it was when we were making the first bit of Springs LP. And I had a song which I wanted, it was like a, could be a duet type thing. And so I said, oh, I've got this song, Vic. Um, uh, would you want to do a duet on it? He'd never heard us or heard of us. And he was a bit reluctant at first, but that's, that's how we met. And, it, and I did get him to the studio and we did this duet which he didn't rehearse for at all i gave him the words but when he turned up he didn't know what he was doing but yes absolutely. but we got on we yeah we've done stuff together on and off since then i know he had a very funny story because i think he knows paul cook from the sex pistols doesn't he so he was just chatting about yes it. i rung vic up vic rang me up the other day and said uh oh where's that photo of you on a donkey because <laughs> it's got these um the photos for the mick jones produced lp and mine was one I sent him of me on a donkey in Spain, and he was just he was just asking me who took took the photo, and he goes, "Oh, hang on a minute, Paul Cook's just turned up," and he just gave the phone to, to Paul, 
and he's going, oh, hello. I said, oh, it's me, Simon. You remember? Oh, yeah, hello, mate. How are you? <laughs> we don't really know each other. But... Oh, yeah, cheers, that, Vic. That's... See you later. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's you're right. It does. Be, um, and it's sort of... He is good friends with Paul Cook, and they, I think they go to Chelsea sometimes together. Right. Occasionally yeah. for he the did football. Tell me some... Yeah, they sort of yes, but it was interesting with it because he he sort of had an amazing musical career. And then he sort of became a postman and various other things, and then started working with people like is it Boz Bora and that gang, kind of that slightly London psychobilly scene. A little bit, yeah. Boz, um, I think I don't know how Vic well Vic knows lots of people, but um, he was working with Paul Baker, wizard, who he, who was a piano player who he worked with as well. At Twickenham, a postman again, and he was going. He went round Wizards and did loads of demos, and that's how we. That's how I got involved with Wizard. I met Wizard through Vic, I think. Yeah, and mm. we were all postmen, so you know, and we all played together then and helped yeah. each other out with various things. Does it? Is it? Has it been? Because I remember just as Lock Down started, I sort of did this interview with Hank Wainford. And he 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 just got this album out. He was going to do all these tour, and and then suddenly it all gets pulled. And he just said, "Oh God, I'm really not feeling it anymore." And I was, and I mentioned, you know, are you sort of now you've got this space to do other things? Are you going to be able to do, you know, have you got anything planned? And he just didn't have it. And I spoke to quite a few musicians over this period, and most are feeling really flat. Has this affected you that much during this kind of? basically the anniversary coming up, isn't it? The 20 something of March. Has it sort of had an impact on your creative kind of ability or sort of enthusiasm? Yeah, it's been better actually. Uh, like I said the other day, I've been practicing the piano a lot. And, uh, and yeah, writing, I wrote a lot more. And my dad was ill, my dad died during, during the lockdown. He died a couple, only, only about a month ago now. Oh. And he had a piano that he was learning, a Yamaha one. And I just picked that up yesterday, actually, from his house. And it's got it's got a load of different presets on it for tunes and stuff that my one hasn't got. So already I've been looking at that, and that's been giving me a few ideas for for backing tracks and things for songs. So, yeah, I'm always on the lookout for stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, lockdown's been good for that. Oh, that's good. Loads more songs. What, what, what with dad being ill and dying, and my son has been, he's been having one or two problems. So it's been a lot of, lot of, what should I, shall we say, not inspiration as such, but <laughs> a, well, I suppose, well, yeah, it would be inspiration. A lot of thinking has been going on. And a it's lot turned of thinking, into, reflection. Because I was watching the, yeah. the, great, the Grayson Perry, you know, the I don't know, art club, and um, he's obviously sort of, an artist, but he's also been talking to all these other people, some quite famous and some just ordinary members of the public, you know, and the fact that a lot of people have turned to art during this quite, then, you know, like you said, you know, people have been having some ups and downs and family stuff and not being able to see family and then family also dying and having those issues where you can't even go to the hospital to see them or have more than six people at a funeral. So that's kind of been quite, that's kind of, because the lockdown at the initial period was a great honeymoon, you know, wasn't it? The first month, we all loved it. The first, you know, well, actually. Yeah, was lots of gardening going on then. The, su the, the summer was here and we were sort of thinking, this is yeah. great. And then it slightly got wet and dark and damp and then people started becoming ill and mentally and emotionally and spiritually. So it has been quite interesting sort of listening to Grace and Perry and then sort of all these other characters from G Boy George, to, like I said, other members of the you know public just kind of turn into art. So obviously having something like your music to sort of focus on must have been quite essential at times thinking, I've just got to take a break and go back into the studio or my room upstairs and just try and start thinking of the next album. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's, in, in that respect, it's been good. But like, like you're saying, I've had a couple of friends who've died, not, not through COVID, different things. Cancer, actually, two cancer ones, some the dads, the son. There's been, been so many bad things happening. But it, like you say, it's been a big time for reflection and all that. A good close friend did have COVID and nearly died. He was, and he's left his job now. So if, I guess the whole thing has made everyone think about what they should be doing or what they want to do. So I've yes. given up work now as well. And I'm thinking, well, like, it was such, such the bad, the, the environment in the post where we, we they moved our office, the environment was really bad. And it was it just, um, that wasn't 
doing me any good, any favours for my health, mentally and otherwise. So I was like, no, sorry, why, why should I be doing all that that's bad for me? Yes. Get on and make some more bloody music. Practice, practice harder. Get more ideas, you know. And is it the case, because I did notice literally in the last 48 hours, the optimism is out there because suddenly you just keep seeing on various social media websites and platforms, you know, tours. Everyone's touring now, aren't they, in the autumn and next year? Oh, God, yeah. So have you also thought, look, fuck it, we're going to have to get out there. I can't, you know, we're going to Oh, we've got a couple of gigs. Hang on, I'll tell you when they are. Bear with us a sec. Kim? Um, yeah, we've um, we've got a couple of gigs with the Blue Orchids. Blue Orchids, they've been they've just kind of announced that they're going to be supporting the Nightingales as well. Yes, well, of course, we're all on the same label. Well, the Bitter Springs are, and Oldfield Youth Club is my band, which I'm concentrating on now, and that's me and Kim and Neil. We're all from last. Oh my god! Party, so it's basically last party. Minus Dan on bass, right? And I do the pianos and guitars. Um, but we're so playing at what you're doing, Brighton. Yeah. Of the Blue Orchids in Brighton at the Prince Albert, and on the seventh of August, crikey, the night before, it's almost the tour. Here's we're the playing thing. at the the Dublin Castle with the Blue Orchids, right? In Camden, Dublin Castle. So yeah, uh, that's two gigs we've got. I mean, obviously they've all they've both been moved around loads. Okay. I know. I like and we're that. we're friends with the Nightingales ourselves, and they've all their tours been moved about three or four times. Yes, I think they're just kind of keeping their fingers crossed. But I did sort of see it keeps getting more and more bad, more and more sort of um, artists and bands who are sort of appearing with them. Because obviously you you saw, and we might have even mentioned it, that the film that came out about a month ago, you know, King Rocker, the story of Robert Lloyd and the Nightingales, which was a yeah. classic. And uh, that must, you must also sort of be looking at your archive, wondering how you're going to sort of put your, because obviously you've got the music, but then do you have lots of memorabilia and posters and flyers and also thinking, God, I could easily write a book about this. We do have some bits and all that, but yeah, it's mainly a lot of it's up on our website anyway, on the, the Bitter Springs website. But no, not really. I did a mini little documentary. My son sort of filmed me for about 20 minutes and a, and a Bitter Springs gig called Cozy Guts. That's, that's, on, that's available on um, YouTube. And yes. Stuff. Oh, you just... You don't... I don't really reflect on stuff that much. It's like, I'm just thinking, get on with the next thing, you know. Yes, I mean, because the amount of people you've worked with, because there's also the band of Holy Joy as well, isn't there? Was one of you, another one of your sort of, I suppose you're in the same area and probably on the same label. Well, the, well they're on, yeah, that's, that's the label that we're with now. But um, we've never really been on a label for uh, a while, you know, a couple of labels we've been on. They were just like fans labels. Uh, this is um, Tiny Global and the Blue Orchids are on them, Holy Joy and the Nightingales. Right. So the, the chap, John Henderson, who's a nice bloke, who's putting all the records out. So we're kind of on a label together. That's how we know each other. But I, I knew Holy Joy before that. We were fans of Holy Joy when we were younger. And then we met again late years later and did some gigs together. Johnny's a great lad. I know they're, they're, they're a really good band, Holy Joy. They have another band that just keeps going and going and, yes. and are still as good as they ever were. I know. I remember sort of um, there was a bass player called Emirate who I sort of vaguely remember. But yeah, I think he was only with them for a very short time. And bass players, I mean, no one remembers a bass player, do they really? Let's face it. A filling bass player is just kind of... Don't tell Kim that. 
that, um, yes, that was only, yeah, but, but they probably weren't having a relationship with him, so, you know, I don't think so. I don't know, mm. it could have been the case, actually. So, yes, there you go. I mean, if you, I mean, because you've, you've got, I mean, I have to say, the body of work you've created and, and the amount of stuff you've put out is quite phenomenal. I mean, you're basically like prints, aren't you, um, on the <laughs> amount of material that you've got. I mean, what would you say to a sort of 16 or 18-year-old self kind of starting out in the, in the murky and interesting world that is creative and rock and roll and pop what 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 would i say to someone you mean yeah or if What's you could have said something to, if you could have said something to yourself when you were starting out as a young youngish teen ish you know your late teens and you're just about to sort of start your musical career that you probably didn't realize you were i just wondered if there was something that you would have just said oh by the way i would do this or i would do that so um yes uh, I, I still don't understand, quite understand that. What something I do different? You mean? Or? Well, I suppose advice. What advice would you have given yourself when they were starting, or you were starting back in? The oh, late? from now, with knowing yeah, what with, I know with now, your, with your hindsight and wisdom, and sort of great deep. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. Well, I yeah, maybe I'd have took more time over stuff. No, nah, probably not. No, it's best. <laughs> It's best to be a bit spontaneous and make things wrong as well as right half the time, you know. And no, I'd, I'd do it exactly the same. Like, really, it would have been nice to have had a bit of financial support along the way, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I'm, like, I don't mind, you know, it is what it is, you know. And, and what we've all done together, like me, Dan, and Neil, and Kim, and then me and the rest of us when we were bit of springs would you it, uh, would a younger self be quite amazed if they saw the older self sort of and the amount of work and material and albums that you put out yeah, yeah i don't know actually i mean there's, there must be some drive i mean it, because you know we haven't had there's not been a lot of critical acclaim along the way or sales you know a lot of the time we've had I've been sort of manager, singer, and writer, so I I get the criticism first hand as well, or I get ignored a lot first hand, and that's that's quite hard to take a lot of the time, you know, when you can't get someone to play you on the radio or or no one to review you, you know. But I don't know, so there must be some drive in me that makes me want to keep doing it. Yes, absolutely. But, yeah, I mean, and how you do know, because you... we we've had long periods where people just. Even now, you know, people have got not much interest in us. There's the odd people like yourself and stuff that that keeps us going, you know, without those little um, occasional bits of people saying, you know, what you're doing is pretty good and worth doing. You know, yeah. it's hard to convince yourself that all the time. So you do need a little bit now and again of encouragement. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and like I said, like I said earlier, it's, it's always you saying about how the record sounds it's always you think you've done right a reasonable job so you've come up with a song and then you think that's going to be brilliant and then when you record it you think oh maybe it could have been slightly better more exciting better sound i could have sung better so then you go on to the next one and you go this time it'll be the perfect song i, I guess you're aiming for that perfect song musically sonically everything so and it's very hard to get that you can hear it some someone Someone might hear it in one of our songs and go, that's brilliant, but you won't necessarily hear it, hear it yourself. No. Well, you know, I, I'd hear it in someone else's song. So I think it's that sort of striving for a perfection that you can't get makes you keep doing it. <laughs> it's just so I guess if I said, I mean, if I said to you this, it was just this listening is the to those early album, singles. Yes. Maybe I wouldn't want to make another one, you know, I don't know. But yeah. Well, I Maybe suppose I, I think... just listened to uh, recently quite a lot of The Last Party and, um, yeah, Mr. Hurst and such songs and thinking, God, the production was fantastic, you know, and remembering quite a lot of those bands in that period, like Stump and Big Flame and Bogshed, you know, it was quite a scratchy sound. And, you know, there were some bands that just had a like, oh, yes, the, I can definitely feel that the production was a little bit, I don't know, better or something. You know, I'm not an expert on this, but, you know, it just sounded a little bit more of a classy kind of um, track or songs at that period. So no, I, don't, I don't really know. We always, after some reviews we'd get, would say terrible production, you know, I think it's, 
it's all in the ear of the beholder, isn't it, really? I mean, I, my favourite Teenage Fan Club album, Far and Away, is the first one, which is the sort of muddy produced one, Catholic Education. When they got smoother and more, I don't know, what's the word, for the, where you could make out what they were saying and everything had a clarity and a sound, I didn't like it so much, you know, when, when it got all polished up. Yes. I but know. someone else might say, oh, that, that first one's unlistenable, you know. <laughs> it's yeah. it's um it's personal taste isn't it really i suppose it is personal taste but i yeah i did have friends who'd always like the first album and then would say oh no when they learned to play their instruments it was just they went downhill i think they were just trying to be you know when you're young you're trying to be slightly quirky or amusing i think yeah they had a bit of a dinosaur junior sound you could hear the influences and sometimes when you're when you're not quite when you haven't quite realized your sound or who you want to be it you sound better maybe i don't know yeah absolutely because you have played i mean the amount of bands and gigs that you've played with other people is quite phenomenal you know when you look at the roster of like seeing what you know whether it was the, the last party or you know the the springs period you know you just think blimey that band and that band you know like Blythe Power with Joseph Porter is one of the great oh, yeah. lyric <laughs> lyric writers of our time and it's like oh yes you're sort of supporting or playing on the same bill as them who was, who was that was at the Jolly Boatman my sister at the wedding anniversary uh, anniversary a uh, wedding reception there that's over in Hampton Court near right. near where we live they never that's... had many gigs there but yeah it was a funny old venue I know but yeah yeah they're great yeah I do and, like looking back on that and thinking, oh, look at the look who we played with there. <laughs> you know, what are they up to now and things like that. Well, funny enough, I think like, I did an interview with Joseph and he's still waiting to get enough money to record the next album. So obviously everybody is... Yeah, I guess he sounds like he's in the same kind of boat as a lot of us. I know. Just trying to get the money together to make records. Because you, you said previously, you know, how much you put into your lyrics... Have you ever, because Joseph has been sort of putting together, I think some sort of slight fanzine or something for each album. Have you sort of been tempted yourself to, you know, publish the lyrics? I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, I think that'd be quite nice. But, you know, it, uh, I, might, I might actually do it at some point. It's not saying I've thought much about. But, yes. Uh, The records and CDs and whatever didn't have the lyrics with them, which I'm, you know, I'm not that bothered about it myself with someone else's records. I, I don't think it's necessary to know every word what anyone says. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I've got things like that myself. You know, I've got the Leonard Cohen ones and things like, that, you know. Yeah, it's always nice uh, to um to see people, what they say. Marky it's Smith been... one. It's always interesting when you spent decades singing a certain line and you realise actually it wasn't the right word. It was a different word you've been using. And you think, yeah, I've written songs by mishearing other people's words. <laughs> so I'd be at a concert, say, I don't know, say, let's just say anyone, for instance. Say I'm at a Kylie Minogue concert. I've never been to a Kylie Minogue concert. But she'd be singing the song and I'd be going, oh, that's a great line. You know, I'd go home and check it out. And it's not the line I thought it was. So I think, well, the line I thought it was, well, I'll have that line. I'll make a, <laughs> you know, I'll make a song about that. Yes, I can't be play, can't be done for plagiarising. I've, I've completely misheard it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not talking about Kylie Minogue. I should have made a different reference, but it could be anyone, you know. It could be anyone, but you, you, <laughs> you put all their work. Yes, because my hearing's not so good anyway. Uh, now I'm, I'm, I don't really hear the. The high register, I think. I just hear the bass one. Yes. So it's a bit difficult with recording. I have to sort of trust the engineer you know, or what have you. But yeah, I've done that lots of times. Not oh. just songs. I've misheard someone speaking and I think, oh, that's a good phrase. And then they're going, no, that's not what I said. And I'm thinking, well, ah, maybe that's just planted that phrase in my head <laughs> and I use that for a song or such. Yeah. But what you, <laughs> what you didn't say was, didn't say was much more, more coherent than what you did say so um there you go there you go well look simon this has been fantastic well thank you for sort of just filling in you know part two sorry about sunday and also early in the week but what i'll do because i'll no no it, thanks thanks um, i can always put it out as two different little kind of bits because it's slightly 
a different but yes thank you and i can always send it to you and then you can sort of put it on your various platforms but um because it's zoom i won't go into total detail but i i don't know why but it won't both files don't go onto the same garage band so i have to put it out as part one and then part two which is a bit irritating but people who like it will like it and they'll go oh that's fascinating okay so um it's always good but look i'm really pleased you got some dates for the for the summer because frankly we've got something to look forward yeah. to other than getting a haircut and going to the dentist yeah. <laughs> well yeah <laughs> Which is great, and uh, yeah, will you get, will you be getting slightly nervous of go get you know playing live and seeing people basically without, without a mask on? No, not at all. But um, it yeah it will be odd because you know being sort of locked up at home almost for so long. It, it'll be nearly eighteen yeah, months. It, yeah. It'll take some getting used to being in like a crowded pub. Yes, I but know. that'd be great. You know. I'll, can't wait really it's just that's the worst thing with this obviously other than the deaths obviously that's the worst thing but this sort of sense of isolation that it's put on everyone you know like and but a lot of people have been missing that um connection with people because all this this skype stuff you know as people of my age it's a bit well it's a bit don't like it you know we started off doing all this skyping when when the first lockdown that i couldn't with groups of people and it's it's okay one on one, but when you're doing it with quite a few people, it's quite quite complicated, isn't it? And it's, yeah, well, they, you know, you, we, 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 all those kind of things that we did in the first month, there was a lot of stuff that because there was some kind mm. house party where everyone, oh, we can all get together and have you know different people yeah. from different houses and we could all chat. And you did it once and thought, fuck yeah, that was irritating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you I can't you can't be real human you know one-to-one -one right, but when you keep having to go oh sorry you, you were gonna say no after you no after you yeah 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 you know it's like oh, this is really painful like, yeah i'm well, quickly tired of that yeah, but no no, no I've, it's been it's been good to talk about as you know it's not like i said before it's not something i'm just thinking about what i'm gonna do next so until someone like yourself asks me these things it's not something i really think about but yeah it's nice it's good nice for you to take an interest and well, no, and, and to do I have this, to say, so. people, people love, well, funny enough, because I've been you know, interviewing quite a lot of people, Alan McGee listens to all these because he walks like five hours a day around London. You'll probably see him somewhere. And oh, wow. He's lost so much weight. It's unbelievable. If you see Alan McGee now, you think, oh, <laughs> wasn't he a small chubby chap? It's like, well, he's no, he's no longer chubby. He's just been walking for the last year for five hours. And he listens to all these podcasts for <laughs> <laughs> so he always he often gets in touch again i just listened to them so that was brilliant so um yeah it's quite funny really so um yeah people do like listening to them because because and and what i found is the more obscure the better because because uh, in a way everyone goes oh do i remember that band i'll be really curious whereas if it was noel gallagher or elton john you go oh you know what kind of unless they say something different i'm not bothered you know so it's you it's, can't get more obscure than me and the, my band so uh, i don't know you would luck with that. Some, so, <laughs> well when i send you the link have a look at some of the other bands you'll go oh they are obscure but i you'll remember you'll know who because i've done you know like joseph porter and even johnny from the band of holy joy and and i just just any indie band that released anything basically and and yeah people someone will always get in touch and go Oh bloody hell! That was great. I never heard of that person speak, and had no idea what. Or I wonder what happened to them. I thought they were dead, sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's uh, do you know that? Well, I was going to say, you... interesting enough, yeah. I've found you know various theories, but they're not that brilliant. But thirty years or twenty-five to thirty years is a real period of time where you know we take things for granted, and then you look back and you think, actually, this is you know musically a lot of stuff you know that that we sort of took for granted during the eighties period. You you suddenly listen to it again, you think. Fuck, it's pretty good. And actually, there's a lot of stuff that I've now picked up that I missed the first time because it was really hard to get hold of or you couldn't hear and thought, God, this is great. But at the time, you know, you, you feel like you've got enough. And then the next year comes and you try and get a house together or you know, you're doing all that kind of stuff just to survive. You can't listen to every single that comes out on the indie front. So, but people, no. I think, you know, like that Nightingale's film, you know, people start to really appreciate stuff again, you know, and think, Oh, yeah, Rob Lloyd was quite good, wasn't he? You know, he was one of the five guys. Oh, Rob's great. You know, yeah, he's all, yeah. He's uh, like apart from him calling me a C U N T, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we he actually actually I've sent him a song now. He's doing an album, and he he re he found out he thought I was the right 
idiot. But then, uh, he, then he'd never heard any of my band. I'd spoken to him a lot of times. And he just thought, who's this nuisance chatting to me? And then he eventually got to hear us. I think we played with him. And then he went, oh, bloody hell, you're actually quite good. <laughs> <laughs> so he stopped calling me a C-U-N-T then, and uh, we're sort of friendly now. <laughs> yeah, Have you heard of a group called Cult Figures as well? No. They've, they're a group that did an album years ago, and they've just done, he's talking about quite kind of obscure people. My friend Lee McFadden's in them on bass. You've probably come across Lee. He's in. He's a famous figure around bands. He's been in um, TV personalities. Um, he's, he's been in so many groups. It's crazy. Uh, not the TV personalities. Um, it was uh, what's oh god, I can't think of his name now. Not Dan Tracy. The other telling. Oh, ATV. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mark Perry. Alternative television. Got you. Mark Perry. He was. He's been in Mark Perry's band as well, but now he's playing with the Cult Figures, and they've got a really good album coming out that you might want to check them out. Yeah, it's well, all over I, Facebook. I, I, sort of, I sort of realised that you'd also played with the uh, the Sounds, who were just an most amazing band, weren't they, during that that period of the eighties? I did. A, I managed to track down the drummer. Who was living in Spain and said, Look, you're in the sound. And you supported them, didn't you? Our first ever gig was, was with the sound at the marquee. Oh, the, yes. So, um, we, yeah. we, we were so young and we'd never done a gig. And it was our drummer then, Steve Infield, was, um, was living with the bass player, Graham from the sound. And they'd done two nights, I think, or a week or something at the marquee to record a live LP called In. In the hot house, I think it was called. Um, and he said, Steve said to him, Oh, well, put my band on as support. And then he did, and we played, and it was like our first ever gig. And it was, again, all the tracks, every song we played that night was never recorded, never, oh, never yeah. came out on a record. Yeah. I've got, got a cassette of it somewhere. We weren't actually that bad. But funny enough, in the audience that night was Phil Martin who eventually played violin with us in the Springs. Right. And, and we spoke about it, and he went, I was at that gig. So he actually, he'd actually seen us back then and as last party and didn't know. He probably wasn't that impressed. <laughs> and that, dear listener, is the end of our casual chat. Anyway, it just goes downhill from then. But a big thank you to Simon for giving me the uh, time for that interview. This has been David Eastall, The C86 Show. If you want to contact me for some exciting reason, make it nice. You can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. Otherwise, yeah, and all these have been archived and you can find them Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, check them out. It could just change your life. Anyway, have a great week. Thanks. <laughs>